Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter 23 of Week 11. Before we get started, we have just one quick announcement. There is going to be no Quiz 3. There is, however, an updated date for Exam 3, and this is going to be at November 12th. For this chapter, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to break this chapter down into three different sections. So we're going to define dairy and talk about its chemical and nutritional breakdown. Then we'll discuss principles related to cooking and baking with milk, and then talk about safe handling practices and practices that are currently in place by the food service industry to make sure that the dairy products that arrive on our shelves are safe. First and foremost, we're going to define dairy and talk about what it is, and then list the foods that fall under the dairy classification. Know the chemical composition and the unique sugar molecule associated with milk and dairy products, and then the overall nutritional value of milk. And as we go through that concept in this chapter, I'm going to highlight the parts of that that are most important for you to know. Three is related to food safety. Recognize health risks associated with spoilage of milk and correlate these risks with actions taken by dairy farmers and companies to ensure a safe, consistent product and then know what you can do in the kitchen to make sure that you are following very safe food practices. Explain the main roles that milk has in baking and identify, identify the chemical changes that occur to milk when it is heated and when various chemicals and factors are in place with milk. Again, we are dividing this lesson into three different sections. The very first section is going to talk about the definition of dairy and what foods fall under the dairy classification. And then it's going to look at dairy's nutritional and chemical breakdown. Very simply, dairy means that it is made from milk. So any of the following products in the second bullet point are dairy products. Milk, yogurt, butter, cottage cheese, cheese, kefir and sour cream and all of these foods do not have the same chemical background but they are still considered dairy and to avoid any confusion eggs are not considered dairy products breaking down the chemical composition of milk we can see that milk falls into these five different classifications the majority of milk or about 85 to 90 percent of it is just water there's a little bit of protein, and this comes in two forms, which we'll talk about more on the next slide, casein and whey. There's a significant amount of milk fat. There are some minerals, such as calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, and then there's a carbohydrate sort, which source, which is lactose. Note that this is the chemical composition for whole milk only. 2%, 1%, and skim milk are going to have lower levels of fat. And also, milk is not always going to be exactly at this composition. Each cow produces different types of milk, and so from each cow, there's going to be slight variations in the actual percentages of each of these individual chemicals. There are two main proteins that are found in milk. There's whey, which is the liquid, and then casein, which is the solid protein. When you separate both of these proteins from milk, they're going to have their own distinct physical features, but the casein is going to be much thicker and in much larger clumps than the whey is. The whey is still in its, it's still in clumps, but these clumps are going to be on the top layer in a more filmy, loose structure than the, the clumped up casein. So if you've ever had cheese curds, these curds are examples of casein. They're very large clumps. So the casein, it contains some fat as well. The whey is the liquid. It contains some milk, sugars, and some salts. To separate these two or to get them apart from the actual milk product, you can do one of two things. You can add heat to the milk, and that's going to help separate it, or also you can add an acid and that's going to help it as well. Salt is going to help that process occur but it's not going to be quite as effective as heat or as effective as adding 
an acid. Whey is actually much more quickly digested by the body and it's considered more efficient. Um, and there's been a lot of research done by bodybuilders looking in to see whether or not whey is going to be more effective at building muscle um, and helping out with overall performance. But the research shows that even though whey is absorbed much quicker than casein is, that it's not necessarily more effective than casein. They're about equally as effective as building muscle and at increasing performance. The picture on the right, this shows the nutrition facts for a serving of whole milk. Milk, it's a pretty balanced source of carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. As you can see in this picture, the whole milk is 8 grams of fat, 12 grams of carbohydrate, 8 grams of protein. Now, of course, we need different levels of carbohydrates compared to proteins compared to fats, but milk still is relatively balanced in the amount and in the percentage of total calories that it provides compared to what it is that we actually need. Now, you probably know milk is a very good source of calcium. There's also a few other minerals that help to support our health as well. And the top three are all related mainly to bone structure. Calcium, it helps with bone structure. It also helps with heart function. It helps with muscle and nerve function. And then also it helps to regulate blood pressure. Phosphorus, it helps to repair body tissue. This includes the muscle, but it's more so related to the structure of teeth and bones. Magnesium helps with calcium metabolism and also aids in bone structure. Enough magnesium in our diet is going to help keep calcium stay within the bones. And then milk also has some sodium and then a B vitamin known as riboflavin. Now, if you look at this picture, you can see that there is 25% of your daily value of vitamin D in a serving of whole milk. This is not naturally occurring. Vitamin D is found in some milk, but this is only when it's added or fortified. So it's not normally present in that high of a quantity in milk. What is the difference between non-fat, low-fat, and whole milk products from a nutritional standpoint? Well, if you look at the food label, we have from left to right the nutrition facts for skim milk, 2%, and whole milk. And really, the only difference is the amount of fat and cholesterol from skim milk to 2% to whole milk. Now, the calories are different as well, but this is only because of the, of the reduced amount of fat as you go to a lower fat product because the carbohydrates and proteins, they're the same in 2% whole milk and in skim milk. There's no changes there. And if you had to guess, which of, one, which of these would you think is healthier? If you said skim milk, there's a good chance that you're actually wrong. Research has been increasingly showing that reduced fat milk is actually not effective at promoting weight loss compared to whole milk. And there is also some research that shows that there is a risk for a hormonal imbalance if you do drink low fat milk. Nutrition recommendations, they have gone back and forth, but understand that the study of nutrition is still relatively new. A lot of the information that we are coming up with today, however, is a lot more accurate than was 50, 20, even 10 years ago. And we are continually learning more and more. There is a good chance that this recommendation will stay. If anything changes in the near future related to milk, there is a good chance that this recommendation will be related to drinking organic milk and to drink less milk in general. But that is an entirely different story. You have plenty to know for this chapter already. That is not important for right now. Just know the main difference, which is the fat content between the low fat, 
whole fat and non-fat milks. There are six different types of sugars and lactose is the sugar that is found in milk and milk products. Lactose is not found in any other foods other than dairy foods. When we eat a food that contains lactose like milk, cheese, or dairy, it's going to be metabolized by an enzyme called lactase. And lactase, an enzyme, it's going to break down lactose. Lactose intolerance is very common throughout the entire world. And this is when the body does not produce sufficient amounts of lactase to pro process the lactose. And what happens in people with lactose intolerance is that they do not digest the lactose quite as well as people that have plenty of the enzyme lactase. And so this causes some significant gastrointestinal or digestive complications, mainly something along the lines of, of indigestion or diarrhea. There's a relatively low prevalence in people with a Northern European background. However, people that come from an East Asian, West African, Arab, Jewish, Greek, or Italian descent have a relatively high risk of lactose intolerance. And this slide shows different areas of the world that have different levels of lactose intolerance. The gray areas, they have no data for them, but the main colors that you can see here are red, brown, and green. Red is a very high prevalence. Brown is a pretty decent prevalence. And the more bright of a green color we get, the lower chance of lactose intolerance that population has. Now in the United States, most of the population has a low prevalence of lactose intolerance. But if you look closely at the picture of the United States, you can see that African Americans and American Indians have a much higher prevalence of this. In this section, we're going to look at the science of baking and cooking with milk. So we'll start off by talking about some of the chemical changes that milk goes through, such as coagulation. We'll talk about separating the different proteins from milk. And we'll talk about what happens when you heat milk and add acids to it. We'll talk a little bit about whipping as well. And we'll finish by talking about some more practical applications of cooking with milk and what is actually going to occur, what we actually see when we're using milk in the kitchen. There are two main chemical changes that we're going to talk about with milk. These are coagulation and then the process of forming. Coagulation occurs when the proteins from the milk separate from the main liquid part of the milk. And this is usually an undesirable reaction that involves the clotting of milk proteins. If you look at the picture on the right side of the screen, you can see what we're talking about. There's the liquid but then there's those little chunks within the protein that rise to the top and form that undesirable top layer that you can see there. And that right there, those are proteins. That is coagulation. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next two slides. And you can achieve this by heating milk, adding acid, adding salts, and also enzymes. And then creating a foam is the second principle we'll talk about. Simply by whipping cream and incorporating air into the cream that we get from milk, you can create a foam. Heating milk is one way that we can cause coagulation to occur. In coagulation, this is going to be the clumping up and binding of proteins. Coagulation by itself is just the binding of proteins. Now remember in milk there are two different types of proteins. We have casein and we also have whey. Whey is the liquid protein, casein is the solid protein. So which of these two do you think is going to coagulate first? The whey. The liquid protein coagulates relatively quickly. Once temperatures reach about 150 degrees, this whey is going to start coagulating. Fortunately, the whey is much smaller when it coagulates than the, pro than the casein 
protein. So that's going to still create an undesirable reaction and leave an undesirable layer of proteins that's going to stay on the top of the milk, but it's not going to be like the casein. Casein requires hours of prolonged heating and very, very high levels of heating for that to coagulate. And that's good because if we add casein coagulate, that would result in very, very large clumps of protein in the milk. Now, some browning can occur, and this is through the Mallard reaction. If you remember, the Mallard reaction involves the heating of sugar and protein. And then going back a few slides in this chapter, protein and sugar is found in relatively high quantities in milk. So it's easy to see how those would bump into each other in the milk structure. And when that is heated, it's very easy for that to interact with one another and then to become brown. When fat is heated, it's breaking down the proteins and the proteins surround the fat in the milk. Now breaking these down is going to release the fat and this can also cause another type of molecule, the fat molecules, to rise to the top of the milk. And so overall you're getting a surface film that's very undesirable that includes the coagulated protein, usually the whey protein, uh, some salts, and then also large droplets of fat. In addition to heat, acids, enzymes, and salt also promote coagulation. So think about if you're making a tomato soup. Tomatoes themselves are very acidic. So if you're mixing in milk with that tomato soup, there's a good chance that it's going to coagulate, the, the milk is going to coagulate relatively quickly. And there's a variety of foods that have different enzymes. Actually, all foods have some enzymes, but certain enzymes are going to increase the rates of coagulation. And then salty foods. So say you have a tomato soup and you decide to throw in a few chunks of ham. Well, ham is typically very processed. There's a lot of salt added to that. So if you add those two, the acid and then the salty food, and you add that to milk and then heat that, that's going to coagulate the milk very, very quickly. Things like baking soda, if you add a little bit of baking soda to that mixture, that can cause the opposite reaction. It can help to prevent coagulation. It will not prevent it completely, but it will at least make it harder, take longer time, or take more heat for that milk to coagulate. We've talked about foam in the chapter that we looked at cookies and cakes. And we talked about these specifically with foam cakes and with eggs. And in this case, we were talking about beating the egg whites and then incorporating air into that. We can do the exact same thing with the fat that we have from milk. The fat from milk is also known as a cream. So we take that cream and we mix it up, we stir it up, and in that process, we're breaking down some of those proteins and as we're beating it, we're allowing air or gas to be incorporated into this product. So there's a dispersion of gas, which is air. Oxygen um, is air, it's a gas. And it's being dispersed in a liquid. So those oxygen molecules are causing a little more separation of that fat. So when that fat is put into a food product, that food product is going to be a little bit more airy and have a little bit more volume to it and not be quite as, as dense and condensed just like a foam cake. Milk has a few main functions in cooking. It's going to increase tenderness and this is going to be more so the case with whole milk and 2% milk versus 1% and non-fat milk. The reason that it increases tenderness, can you guess? It's because of the fat content. Fat increases the tenderness of a product. Whole milk has 
the most fat. 2% has some fat, but smaller amounts. 1% has even a smaller amount of fat. And do you think anything is going to happen with skim milk and tenderness? Probably not, because there's no fat in skim milk. There's a distinct flavor to milk that's added to the food products that it is mixed with. It provides moisture, it is a liquid, and that can have its own effect. We talked about what happens when we mix water with flour, that's going to create gluten. So the milk, when we add that to a baked product that has some flour in it, there is going to be that same interaction that occurs with water. The milk is going to help that turn into gluten. Milk also, it actually increases the shelf life of baked goods. This is because the proteins in milk, they trap water molecules and they cause water to stay within baked goods. And also the crumb structure that you have in crumb cakes, and you can see that in the picture on the right, milk helps to create the porous crumb structure that you find in cake crumbs. But the most important things that you know is that higher fat milks, in, they add more tenderness to the foods that they are cooked with. Um, milk is going to provide a decent amount of moisture. And also know that it increases the shelf life of baked goods. And finally, we're going to end by looking at the production of two different milk products, cheese and yogurt, and then also talk about processing. So what do we do in the kitchen at home to make sure that foods are saved? And what does the food industry do to make sure that dairy foods are safe and also of a very consistent nature. We'll talk about what we mean when we say consistent in two slides. Now, obviously there are some differences between the structure and the content of cheese and yogurt, but their production is still relatively similar. At least the production and the processing that is required to get the base structure of cheese and yogurt which is the casing. So for both cheese and yogurt, you need, to you need to get the casing to coagulate into curds. The whey is going to coagulate, but it's not going to form the large clumps that you get from casing. And while this is not desirable when you're making a soup, it is going to be very useful when you are making products such as cheese and yogurt. Now, the processing of milk to get casein to coagulate is much longer and much more intensive because casein requires a lot more heat, a lot more acid to coagulate than whey. But to do this, a bacteria is added to the milk, and this is responsible for fermentation. Now, what fermentation is, is it happens when bacteria eats the sugar molecules that are in milk. So the sugar molecules in milk, these are lactose. So it eats the lactose molecules, and then from that, it releases its, its waste product or its byproduct, which is lactic acid. Now this is an acid. Remember, acid aids in the coagulation process. So this is very good for cheese and yogurt. So that cheese, so the milk is going to be surrounded by this acid. And over a long period of time, this acid is going to cause coagulation. The whey is going to separate and eventually the casein is going to separate. And then we can take the casein from that and then make the cheese yogurt. And at this point, the processes for producing the yogurt and cheese are somewhat different, but you still have the essential base product that's required for each of these, this being the casein. Now, that it may seem logical to add plenty of bacteria to promote coagulation because this is going to produce the acid. However, if we add too much, it's going to cause a very sour flavor. And finally, 
we talk about food safety and milk. Now, why is this so important? Milk and dairy, just like any other animal products, are incredibly susceptible to contamination. So what the food industry does is most of them are going to put their milks through a process known as pasteurization. This involves heating the milk in a sterile container to destroy the bacteria because as you remember, if you heat foods to a certain temperature, this is 140 degrees and above, bacteria cannot survive above 140 degrees. So that was going to kill all of the bacteria. Now, there are some states that do allow the sale of milk that's not pasteurized, but if you go to the grocery stores, there's a good chance that most of the milks at the store, if not all of them, are going to be pasteurized. Some people say that you're also killing very beneficial nutrients when you're pasteurizing milk, and that is probably very true but at the same time because milk is just so susceptible to contamination it's important that there is some type of process that is killing the bacteria that could form and could be very harmful and dangerous to us homogenization is a pro another process used by food industries if milk was not homogenized there would be very large fat droplets that would form on the top of milk. This is basically the cream of the milk. Now, when we homogenize milk, what we do is we break those fat droplets down into very small pieces. And if they're smaller, they can much more easily be spread throughout or be dispersed throughout the milk product. So when we drink milk, we don't see that. But if we did not homogenize it, we would see we'd have to shake up the milk really quickly and then drink it because that would be the only other way that we would have a milk with that same consistency throughout the entire product. Now, remember earlier in this class, we talked about the danger zone, the four hour temperature danger zone. So if foods are left out between 40 and 140 degrees for a time period of over four hours, there's a good chance that they may have bacteria that has developed two levels high enough to cause contamination and cause illness when they are consumed by us. So it's very important that we are keeping milk in the refrigerator and being mindful of that four hour danger zone because we cannot take it out for an hour put it in the fridge and go back to zero, we have to be mindful of any time that we leave it out. So if we put, take it out for an hour, that means that the milk has been left out for an hour. The next time that we take it out, we only have three hours instead of four hours of leaving that at room temperature before there's a good chance that the bacteria inside the milk could develop to harmful levels.